Okay, let me just go to uh, full screen here. Okay, so uh, part two. So we just finished talking about uh, double side branch suppressed carrier modulation. So modulation, demodulation, how you actually send um, a signal through amplitude modulation using this scheme. All right. So, sorry. So the underlying assumption here is that both of the cosine waves on the transmitter side and the receiver side are what are known as synchronized. So what it means by synchronized is that each of them are have a carrier frequency that is frequency vary that is varying in time, but then when you take a look at one time point in the on the on the uh, transmitter side, the exact same time point should match on the receiving end. So they should both be in sync with each other as they vary. Okay, so that's what it means when they're synchronized. So we assume that the oscillator on the transmitter side, so TX means transmitter, okay, and the uh, the carrier on the receiver side. They're what's known as synchronized. So they're actually they're both varying at the same time. So there's no phase shift, there's no like, there's no differences in frequency. They're both exactly the same frequency with exactly, and they're varying at exactly the same points in time. All right? So we have the uh, carrier frequency, which we'll call L of M, which means the uh, modulator. So M means modulator. Okay? So it's generating uh, a cosine wave of a particular frequency, and there might be a phase shift, right? So this is the general form. And then this is the demodulator frequency, or the demodulator carrier, okay? And if you want them to be synchronized, this means that both of the frequencies are equal to each other, and both of the phase shifts are equal to each other. Generally, both of these are zero, and you know F1 and F2 is equal to the same carrier frequency. But they're exactly the same, okay? So that's what it means by they're synchronized. In practice, they normally are not. You can never truly get the two frequencies to exactly be the same. Like if you ever fuddled around with, um, you know, uh, a waveform generator, you know that the knob where you're trying to get it to be exactly like one kilohertz or 1.2 kilohertz is very hard to actually get it to be exactly one. So you have it on the receiver side, and you, then the transmitter side, you're also trying to get it exactly to be one or one, you know, one kilohertz, but it's never going to be exactly the same. So when you have that particular case, if you if you have those if you have two frequency generators that are not exactly the same, like the the frequencies may be off a little bit, this is actually what happens if you decide to do this modulation scheme with mismatched carrier frequencies or you know carrier generator frequencies. Okay, so in general, we're gonna what we're gonna have is we're gonna have a transmitter of some known frequency with no phase shift. So this is the this is what's this is the ideal case or the ideal transmitter. Okay, on the receiver end, you may have a little bit of a difference between the actual carriers. So you're going to have some difference in terms of frequency, and there also might be some phase shift as well. So this is uh, receiver side not synchronized. Okay. All right. So let's say. Well, so what happens when we actually take the signal? So when you actually, um, this is this is the uh, modulated signal. So you're going to take this and modulate it by the frequency on the receiving side, the modulator side. All right. And then if you want to demodulate it, you just take this signal and then you multiply it by the demodulator cosine. So this is what's happening here. Okay. And we, if you see here, there are two cosines that are not exactly the same. So if you remember the property where when you take two cosines and you multiply them together you can split them up into a sum of two cosines. So this is cos of a minus b, right, plus half cos a plus b. And that's just happening over here. So this is actually should be a minus, but it doesn't really matter. You know, minus and plus doesn't really matter. But then if you take, so if you call this a, and if you call this b, if you subtracted a and b, you know, the actual 2 pi fcts will cancel, and you're just left with 2 pi and delta ft with the phase, all right? And then this is what happens. So this is a minus b, and this is a plus b, all right? So this is what happens when you take this and you add this and you add them all together. Also, you uh, scale by half as well. Okay. Now, as you see here, we have a uh, message signal that is that has a, a, some additional phase, but then we also see that there is um, it's centered at two fc plus some offset. And then we can see here that we have the original message signal, but there's an additional term associated with it. So this is actually constant, right? So uh, then we have uh, 2 pi fc of t, so there, there's actually, it's actually a, uh, a constant you know, cosine wave, I suppose. All right, so we have this instead. Okay, so if the mismatch in frequencies is very small, so that means that if you're, 
shift here, if the, if the offset is much, much smaller than the actual carrier frequency, then what will happen is that, you know, it may, it may work. Like, you, should, you, you, you can have electronics that will actually recover the actual signal properly. So the spectrum of the second term, this guy, will be centered at plus minus 2FC with some additional offset, okay? And then assuming that this is small enough, if you put it through the low-pass filter, it's totally fine. So this actually, you know, this term goes away. And you're left with this term here, which is okay. Like you have the original message signal, and then there's some. Uh, you have a, you know, you have a cosine term that's varying, which is actually, which is actually fine. All right. So if this is very small. What will happen is that remember the cosine of a very small number is going to be approximately equal to one. So this will be approximately equal to one. So it's kind of varying a little bit, but still, you have the original message signal, which is totally fine. Okay. So uh, this is just a block diagram of what's happening here. So this is, remember, this is, this is from the transmitter. You transmit and then you multiply by the mis mismatched cosine. So this is the mis and then you, this is what happens when you get the actual uh, multiplication. So this is what happens when you demodulate it. You put it through a low pass filter and then you get the actual result. Okay, so once you put it through the low pass filter, this, of course, gets filtered out. Remember, you're centering the low pass filter at the zero hertz and then it, it has a, a bandwidth of the same size as the message signal, and then anything outside of that range you filter out. So this goes away, and you're left with this trim by itself, which is actually fine. Okay, and that's what we get here. So if we assume that there is no mismatch, if the shift in frequency between them is actually zero, so if you actually get it perfectly synchronized, then you'll get it so that it looks like this instead. And if you're lucky enough to have a zero phase shift, then you just get the original signal by itself at a scale by AC over two, which is what we're looking for in the end. Okay, so if there is no mismatch, so if there's no mismatch in frequency, then you get this. So you just get an additional gain factor. And assuming this is small, then it shouldn't affect it as much. So you still have the original message signal. Okay, so if we're lucky, we if we have a zero phase shift, then you're just going to get the original uh, thing by itself, where k prime is just equal to ac over 2. Okay? If we're unlucky, if we so happen to have a, you know, a, frequen a frequency generator here that has a phase of pi over 2, well, if you remember, cos of pi over 2 is equal to 0, right? So this becomes 0, and you unfortunately get no output. And then any other values of phi of 0, you're just basically taking ac over 2, and you're kind of decreasing the gain a little bit, because from you know, if cos of 0 is 1, and then cos of pi over 2 is 0, and then anything varying between the two is just decreases from 1 down to 0. So that's what it means by varying degrees of attenuation. So it, ju it just decreases the gain of the message signal slightly. And then obviously you can reverse that uh, if you know what the phase was, but just multiplying by the inverse. Okay? So if you want to successfully demodulate double sideband suppressed carrier signals, you have to perform what is known as synchronous detection. So what it means by synchronous detection is that you have to make sure that the carrier on the receiving side and the transmitter side, they both have to match in frequency and they have to match in their phase shifts as well. So that's what it means by synchronous. So you have to, so the, the electronics to actually do this, to actually perform synchronous detection, where you make sure that the carrier frequencies are the same, is actually quite expensive. Um, so it's not commonly used, even though this is one of the most uh, simplest ways to transmit uh, amplitude modulated signals. Performing synchronous detection is actually very expensive to do, so it's not commonly used anymore. All right, so that's why we take a look at more other other technologies. But let me just uh, talk about this a little bit. So, when you're taking a look at modulated waveforms, so modulated waveforms with suppressed carrier terms, so what we talk about is DSBSC. Okay, it requires fairly complex circuitry. And what you have to do is you also you have to perform phase synchronization as well as frequency synchronization too. So phase and frequency synchronization too. So it's it's both of them. Okay. So you have to make sure that the frequencies on the receiver and the transmitter side they have to match up. So there there are very expensive electronics to figure out how to do that. And it's also what is known as coherent detection, which so the receiver end and actually uh, is actually quite expensive to manufacture. All right, so there's got to be a, a better way to actually transmit amplitude modulated signals without having to shell out a lot of money on the receiving end. And there is, which we'll talk about next. Okay, so in applications where you have one or few transmitters and a large number of receivers, so for example, you've got a radio station, whether you're listening to Indy 88 or Edge World 2.1, so there's, although very few transmitters in the city, but there are a lot of receivers. So your car, you know, your stereo at home, 
also there are a lot more receivers that are out in the city than there are actually transmitters. So if you want people to actually listen to your radio station, you want to be able to create receivers that are cheap because you want people to listen to your stations, all right? So it's actually more co beneficial to do more work on the transmitter side and then on the receiver side, you make it as simple as possible so people will want to listen to your radio, you know, radio signal or radio channel and buy a receiver that is cheap, okay? So it makes economic sense to, to make receivers as simple as possible, all right? So just a you know, block diagram, you know, you've got, uh, I guess, you know, you know you've got, uh, you know, your, your, this is sending, uh, you know, radio signals, right? And then you have a bunch of radios, right? You know, and then you maybe your phone, I guess, or so this is, this would be receivers. Okay, so this is a tower. And then you're transmitting over this way. So you want, so the number of transmitters is much, much less than the number of receivers, which makes sense. You have, you know, the receivers are a dime a dozen. You find them in your car, you know, you, you, if just a certain Android or uh, iPhones will actually have a built-in receiver chip that you can actually use to um, demodulate radio signals, if you will. But yeah, but that's very common here. So to facilitate simple demodulation, what you can do is you want to be able to add a carrier term on top of the transmitted signal. So you want to transmit a separate carrier term in the same frequency band as a double sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulated signal. So not only do you want to transmit the shifted spectral components, you also want to add a carrier on top of the transmitted signal. That way on the receiver end, there's no synchronous detection or coherent detection. The carrier is built into the actual transmitted signal so that you can derive a receiver that is very simple in electronics and you'll be able to uh, receive your signal, uh, you know, cheaply and, you know, even more efficiently too. So let's consider amplitude modulation signals of the form. You have a double sideband suppressed carrier, uh, you know, spectrum plus an additional carrier at the end. Okay, so we have, and we're adding a carrier on top. Okay, so this is what is known as double sideband large carrier. So when you're talking about amplitude modulation, Okay, what they really mean is double sideband large carrier. So when people talk about performing amplitude modulation, it's not double sideband suppressed carrier, it's double sideband large carrier or DSBLC. So this is actually what they're talking about when they talk about amplitude modulation. Okay, so if you want to transmit an AM signal or a double sideband large carrier signal, you perform, you, you transmit a double sideband suppressed carrier signal plus an additional carrier. So that carrier by itself is just a cosine wave that is constant with a constant amplitude of AOC, okay? So notice that the, you, you, what you have to notice is that when you uh, perform modulation with the double sideband suppressed carrier, you have to make sure that the carrier as well contains the same frequency. So the actual frequencies are matched, okay? So when you take a look at this term here, you'll notice that there's a cosine omega C term. The cosine omega C term is common, and then you can factor out the cosine omega C term and what you're left with is this. So what this is actually doing is you're taking your message signal and applying a DC offset to the actual message signal itself. So that's actually how you do it. So it's actually very simple to do. Just take your amplitude modulated signal and apply a DC offset to it. And naturally you're performing a double sideband large carrier modulation instead. So what you're doing is you're adding a DC offset. Okay, so that's actually what's happening. So if you want to figure out what the transform is, well, basically you're just going to find the transform of this guy, which is over here, right? And plus the transform of this guy. And we know the transform of a cosine is just two impulses that are centered at omega C or F of C, depending on what notation you're using, okay? So we have the double sideband suppressed carrier part plus, a, plus the actual spectrum of the carrier. So this is what it looks like. So you have the spectrum by itself and they actually have the additional two impulses because of the carrier wave. So this is what it means by large carrier. So you're transmitting the actual double sideband suppressed carrier component and you're adding an additional carrier on top, which is just basically a DC offset. And then you're gonna modulate with a cosine. Okay, so a carrier plus double sideband suppressed carrier means double sideband large carrier. So this actually means amplitude modulation. So when you talk about amplitude modulation in practice, you're actually talking about double sideband large carrier. Okay, so that's what's actually the actual term for amplitude modulation. That's what is used in practice. Okay, so this is what happens in terms of uh, taking a look at it in terms of time domain and in terms of frequency domain. So this is the time domain. And this is frequency domain. Bless you.
Okay, so this is your original message signal, and this is what the spectrum looks like. So there's some bandwidth, which we'll call B of X. Okay, so when you perform double sideband surplus carrier modulation, remember that you're taking each of the spectrum here and you're shifting it plus minus whatever the carrier frequency would be. So this is FC plus, and this is FC minus. I think I got that right this time, right? And this is minus F of C and minus F of C plus. Okay, so. When you're performing amplitude modulation, all you're doing is you're just taking your message signal and you're applying a DC offset, all right? So what's happening here is there's an offset here, which is called AFC, all right? And then the only difference in the actual spectral output is that there's just additional impulses that are centered at the carrier frequency. And so this is the spectrum for the double side transpose carrier, and this is the spectrum for amplitude modulation. So very simple. It's just adding a couple of impulses to the spectrum. So the key elements of an amplitude modulation signal are the amplitude and what's known as the envelope, okay? So the envelope you may remember from uh, ELE-404 or even ELE-504, if, you, if you've taken like, or if, yeah, I think it's 504, what, you, what it's called. The envelope is basically just the positive part of the message or the, of the wave itself. So any values that become negative are simply positive. So it's the envelope is just simply the absolute value of the, of the amplitude itself. So the amplitude is simply your message plus the actual carrier. So you know, because, so this here is the actual amplitude of the cosine wave. That's why we call it amplitude, because you're actually changing the height of the actual carrier. The envelope is simply just the absolute value of the actual amplitude. And the reason why we take a look at the absolute value is mostly to make the electronics, the receiving end, a little more simpler to deal with. All right? So. This is what happens uh, when we start talking about demodulation. So modulation is very simple. All you're doing is you're just taking your, you're just taking your uh, message, you're, multi you're mul multiplying by cosine wave to modulate it, and then you want to add an additional DC offset to the modulated wave to, to get it to the, so that it's uh, AM or DSBLC. Okay. So what happens if you want to demodulate the signal? So it's actually quite easy. But before I do that, let me talk about uh, this of uh, this bit where we're actually talking about the envelope. Okay. So the first case is when the envelope here is actually greater than zero. So what this means is that A plus M of T, all of the values are greater than zero. Okay, so if your message signal plus the actual carrier, if everything is above the horizontal axis, then the envelope is simply just the amplitude itself, which is great, okay? However, if you have your envelope, if your message actually goes below zero, if the actual, if the actual um, varying, it's, so if the actual amplitude here, this is what we call A of T, if there are any situations that go below zero, what will happen is that the envelope will just simply take the negatives and turn them into positives, but there will be some phase reversals because remember, when you are going below the, uh, you know, the horizontal axis, all right, you have a negative for the cosine, so we're actually, we're actually introducing a phase reversal. So in terms of the actual envelope itself, it's okay. It'll just uh, it'll just um, go up to the positive sign, but yeah, the actual amplitude function itself goes negative. So uh, actually, let me yeah. So this should be E of T is okay. Well, yeah, E of T should be minus there. But yeah, so this is what happens here. So you know you have some amp you know have some values that are greater, and then you may have some values that are less, and then it just it, you're just doing a phase reversal there. Okay. So what you can actually do is, if you remember from 404, um, all you have to do is just, you can actually create an envelope detector. So it's just basically a diode in series with, so you have a diode in series with an RC circuit in parallel. Okay, so it's a very simple envelope detector. Because remember, when you're introducing that DC offset, what you can do is, uh, assuming that the, uh, assuming you have the ideal case here, all you have to do is just, you know, create an envelope detector to actually detect the envelope of the signal and then you just remove the DC offset and then you get the original message signal when you're done. But we'll talk about that later. But you can actually just use an envelope detector and that's from 404, okay? So we know that the envelope here is proportional to the message as we've seen that already, okay? So uh, the envelope, assuming that, you know, there are no values of the actual, you know, um, offset signal that go below, you know, the horizontal axis, if that's the case, you know, this is the ideal case, then the envelope is just simply the amplitude, which is great. All right, so if there is a case where the envelope, it goes below the horizontal axis for some, you know, for some values of T, then what's gonna happen is that it's no longer just a scaled or shifted version of the actual message signal, right? So what'll happen is that you'll get phase reversals at the zero crossings, which, which is what I talked about. So 
if you have this particular case, once you have the phase once you have phase reversals, then it's actually not possible to use an envelope detector. You're going to have to use a synchronous detector for DSPSC modulated signals to actually retrieve the actual message. So you want to make sure that um, you specify a carrier height that is large enough so that the lowest part of your message is non-negative. And then if you can do that, then you can certainly use an envelope detector to actually you know, demodulate your signal. Okay? So you have to make sure that this condition is satisfied in order to make sure that you can use an envelope detector. Okay, so just a review from electronics. So what exactly is an envelope detector? As I talked about, it is basically a diode in series with an RC circuit in parallel. Okay, so we have the resistance here, and then you have the you have the capacitance, which we'll call, I guess, uh, C. Right. So there's the. Uh, okay, we'll talk about that later. So you have the load resistance, you have the uh, capacitor, and then you also have what's known as the uh, source resistance. So this is R of S, and this is R of L. So you can think about this, the equivalent resistance when you're looking in this way, so that's defined as R of S, right? And then R of L would be the load resistance, so what is actually seen at the output. Okay, so this is a simple envelope detector, and we'll talk about how it works uh, very briefly. Okay, so this is a nice diagram of what I'm talking about here. Okay, so when the amplitude modulated signal is positive, okay, so when the so if you remember how a diode works, so a diode works by checking the potential between two nodes. So it would be in forward bias mode if the potential on the left side would be greater than the right side. So current will flow this way. So that means it would be technically be a short circuit. If the potential was reversed, if the left if the left potential was actually lower than the right side, then it becomes an open circuit, right? So what's happening here is that. If the amplitude modulated signal is positive, and we also know that the amplitude modulated signal is greater than the current voltage seen at the output, then what's going to happen is that this diode becomes short circuited. So what's going to happen is that your voltage, as the as the the voltage will actually accumulate in the capacitor. So remember, what the capacitor does is that it stores charge, right? So as you push current through it, you're rewarded with the voltage. So that's the that's the purpose of the capacitor, right? So as you as the voltage on the left side here, if it's bigger than the right side, then what's going to happen is that you will keep increasing the voltage of this capacitor up until a point where the output of the voltage will actually match what the amplitude modulated signal is. And once they match, it doesn't charge anymore, right? So then as soon as the waveform dips, so as soon as the output voltage is above the amplitude modulated wave, then what's going to happen is that uh, the current will actually start discharging, right? Because if this is an open circuit, this discharges, and this is what happens over time. So remember, at, right at the point where the amplitude modulated wave becomes less than the current output voltage, then as this goes below, what's going to happen here is that the voltage, the capacitor, will actually start discharging over time. So this is what is happening here, up to the point where the output voltage becomes, it meets the voltage of the amplitude modulated wave, and then you start charging it up again. So that's what the envelope detector does. So you have an input voltage coming in. As soon as that input voltage, you know, it exceeds the output voltage, you start charging that capacitor. And then once the input voltage drops below what the actual output voltage will be, then the capacitor starts slowly discharging over time, up to the point where the amplitude modulated wave will go above the output voltage again, and that's what you get. So that's basically what's, what's happening over here. So that's just a, like basically a five minute summary of what an envelope detector does for 404, all right? So we have a charging time constant. And what this charging time constant is, is how quickly the voltage discharges or the current discharges over time. And that is controlled by the product of adding the source and load resistance multiplied by the capacitor. Okay? So this fact is very important here. Okay? You have to make sure that the time constant or the amount of time it takes to discharge the actual capacitor has to be small enough in comparison to the carrier so that um, during the times where the diode is turned off, you want to make sure that the, you know, the envelope is kind of maintained. So if you take a look here, remember if this is the message signal here, you want to make sure that the uh, time constant is small enough so that the discharge is, you know, as, as it starts discharging over time, it follows the message signal, you know, as best as possible. If you make the, actually, if, no, sorry, you want to make the time constant large, not small, because if you actually make it small, what will happen is that the discharging will happen so quickly that it actually falls away from the actual message signal, which is not what you want. You want to make the time constant, you know, relatively large enough so that once the, uh, you know, the amplitude modulated wave 
goes below a certain amount, you want it to make sure that it follows the message signal over time. So you want to make the discharge amount kind of make sure it follows the message, but you don't want to make it discharge too quickly, or it's not going to be the actual message anymore. Okay, so that's what it's talking about here. So that it can quickly charge up during the peak voltage such that the time constant is much less than 1 over the carrier period, or basically it's just the period, right? So you can think of this as the period is just 1 over FC. Okay? You want to make sure that the period in between the peaks is less than this amount, so that you, you want to make sure that it follows the envelope as best as possible. Okay? So this is the charging time constant, so you want to make sure that it, you know, it charges as quickly as possible. Actually, I, I actually got my facts mixed up. So charging time constant means that you, you want to make sure that it charges as quickly as, you know, as it varies. Okay? And then the discharging co time constant is basically just low times the capacitance. So what you want to do here is you want to make sure that this constant is long enough so that when it discharges, you want to make sure that it follows the message signal as best as possible. So the charging time constant is how long it takes to quickly charge up. So you want to make sure it follows the actual wave as you're going positive. And then the discharging co time constant is you want to make it slow enough to follow the actual message signal. So the actual discharge constant is long enough compared to the period but it's not so long such that it will, if you make it too long, what's going to happen is that the discharge becomes slow, and then when the message signal go, dumps below, it doesn't discharge fast enough, and you're not actually getting the message signal anymore. So this is what happens when the discharge is too large, and this is what happens when it's too small. So this is what I was talking about from before. So you want to make sure that the discharging time constant is in, in between the period and the bandwidth of the signal. So you want so this is the accepted, you know, uh, this is the accepted range to make sure that uh, you know you're able to pick up the envelope of your message, you know, as accurately as possible. Okay? So the output of an envelope detector has ripples. Okay? So if if you actually can see here, we see that your message signal has a little bit of oscillation. So if you want to get rid of the actual oscillations, what you can do is you can use a low pass filter to actually get rid of that those actual oscillations. So the output of an envelope detector has ripples. So what you'll do is you can use a low-pass filter. But then once you have that low-pass filter, right, what's going to happen is that you will still have your message signal like this, but there's a DC offset. Okay? If you want to remove that DC offset, then basically you need to have a DC blocker. So if you remember what if you remember from ELE202, this is a classic DC block. Oops, right? So for at DC, the capacitor acts as an open circuit, but in AC, it acts as a short circuit. So only the AC goes through, and the DC gets null to zero. Right? So this is a standard, typical DC block. We have an RC in series. Okay? So that gets rid of the actual DC, and what you get is your original message signal like that. Okay? So you have an envelope detector. This gets rid of the ripples, so no ripples. Okay? And then you have a DC block. Right? So I'm actually I'm not going to test you on how this actually works. It's not. It's not part of the game here. I just want to test on your understanding of amplitude modulation and all that. But don't expect questions on asking you how an envelope detector works. That's part of your electronics, which is not which is not part of this course. But I just wanted to explain this to you so you have kind of an understanding of how amplitude demodulation works. But don't expect questions such as explain how an envelope detector works. It's not it's not that's not that's not how I roll here. It's just I'm just, I'm just testing on communications theories. Okay, so no, don't expect any electronics analysis in the, in the, on the actual midterm, okay? So don't, don't worry about that. But I just wanted to put this here to give you an understanding of how it works, all right? Okay, so we have a constant which is called the modulation index, okay? So what the modulation index does is that it gives you an indication of whether or not you're able to successfully demodulate your signal using just an envelope detector. If, if this actually will also give you an indication of whether or not you should be using synchronous demodulation or just an envelope detector, which is what I talked about. But it's a nice um, value that gives you an indication of whether you can go with simple or you'll have to go with a more complicated case, which is synchronous demodulation. Okay? So it's defined as the largest absolute value of your message signal divided by the carrier. So what I mean by so MP means that you take a look at your message signal. Okay? You choose at any point in time whatever the largest amplitude, the absolute value, the largest absolute value is, that would actually be what MFP is. So for example, if I had a message signal that looked like this, something like that. If this was three, and if this was negative five, and if this was one, MP would simply be five. Okay? It's the largest possible number, ignoring the negatives, that you'll ever see in your message signal. In this case it's five. If you want to do another one, just to be sure, something like this, if this is 3, and this is, I guess, 0, and here is 1, <coughs> MFP would actually be 3. 
Okay, so it's the largest number that you'll ever see in your message signal ignoring any of the negatives. So just take all the negatives, turn it into positives, and see what is the largest value in your actual signal. Okay, so you can demodulate your signal using an envelope detector, making sure that the amplitude, it, the, so once you add the DC offset to the message signal, it should never cross the negative. Okay, so this is what the situation is. Or you can actually show that if your modulation index is between 0 and 1, then you're able to use an envelope detector successfully. Okay? <coughs> so you want to make sure that this is the case. And it's actually, it actually makes sense. You don't have to really prove that it actually makes sense. All right? So if my message signal, right, if my message, so for example, let's say my carrier is equal to 1 and my message signal is equal to 2. Okay? So what's going to happen here is that, remember, this will oscillate between, uh, you know, plus minus 1, for example. Actually, no, that's, that's a pretty bad example. Let me see here. So 3, 2, so 2 over 3. Actually, no, never mind. So, okay, so what it means when it's 0, that, that's up the point where um, you're actually, you're right at the brink of demodulation, and 1 is where the actual, so 0 means that the largest value is right at the peak of where you want to demodulate, and the value of 1 is where the smallest value is right at the horizontal axis. But I'll talk about this later. But basically, between 0 and 1 is an indication to tell you that you know you can actually use an envelope detector successfully to demodulate. I'm going to prove that situation later. Okay. So even though you know between 0 and 1 is it's what's known as a sufficient condition. So what a sufficient condition means is that, in general, this is the case, but you will see some exceptions to the rule, which will actually still work. So this means that sometimes mu can be bigger than 1, and it will still work. So that's what it means by sufficient condition. Okay? So it'll still work. Okay? So when you're actually broadcasting AM signals, there's actually different uh, metrics that they use. So it's not just the modulation index. There are also other um, performance measures you can use. All right? So what we're going to take a look at are the positive and negative swings of the envelope. So what I mean here is that we're going to define a term called A of max, where it's basically the largest amplitude you will ever see. In this case, this is just equal to M of P. Right? No, not MAP, but it's just um, MAP in terms of the positive side. So you take a look at your message signal, you take a look at your carrier. So you, what you're doing is, as you, you don't take a look at the absolute value anymore. What you're doing is you're taking a look at each point in time, and you're figuring out, once you add the carrier on top of your message, whatever the largest value would be, that's what A max would be. Okay? And then A of min is just the smallest value that, would be, that you would get once you perform amplitude modulation. So for example, if I add a signal like this, okay? Let's say this is 3, this is 1, and then this is 2, okay? A of max will be 3, A of min will be 1, okay? And then you can also go to the negative case too. So if I had, let's say, for example, minus 2, right, and then something like this, right? In this case, A of min would be minus 2. So we're also taking a look at the negatives as well. So we're taking a look at the largest p time point, or the, the time point which gives you the largest amplitude, and also the time point that gives you the smallest amplitude. So using these things, what we can do is we can actually define the modulation index and the, the modulation index in another way. So once you figure out what the largest and smallest amplitudes are at any point in time, you can just subtract them both and divide by two times the carrier height. And that'll also give you a modulation. So this is an, al this is an alternative definition. Okay? So remember that this was MP over A. See? So that's one definition, and then this is another definition too. But these two may not be the same, and I'll talk about why they may not be the same later. But for the most, you know, for the moment, you can, we can show that these both are equal. Okay? We also have what's known as the positive modulation index. So this is talking about the uh, modulation index when you're taking a look at just the positive swing of things. So you're taking the largest value that you see in the amplitude modulated wave, subtract it with your carrier, and then divide it, divide it by your carrier. And then you can do the same thing for what's known as the negative modulation index. So this is mu of minus, and then u of plus is the positive. It's just your carrier, subtract the smallest value divided by the carrier. So mu plus is the positive modulation, and mu negative is the negative modulation. So the reason why you use these three things, it, we'll talk about that much later, but it's, um, it's, there are other performance measures that you can consider to, when you're considering uh, transmitting using AM or DSBLC. OK, so here's a quick example. Here's a single tone modulation. So what we're doing here is that we're going to use 
um, AM modulation, but the message signal is just a simple cosine wave. So it's a cosine wave with a simple uh, amplitude, so the amplitude's not changing over time. It's just a simple uh, cosine wave where the amplitude is what's known as A of M. Okay? Also, the uh, message, the actual uh, frequency, you know, the uh, baseband frequency, the frequency of the actual message is much less than the carrier. Okay? So I'd like to point that out to be sure. So we're going to do three examples here. So first, we're going to figure out what the modulation indices are. And then we're going to take a look at the envelope for each of these three cases, right? When the ratio between the message of the, you know, the height of the message with the height of the carrier is less than one, when it's equal to one, and when it's greater. And then we'll actually sketch the spectrum of the AM signal as well. OK, so evaluate the parameters. Very simple. So remember, M of P is the largest absolute value that you'll ever see at any point in time. So because this is a simple amplitude, this is a simple message signal that varies between plus and minus A of M, right? It makes sense that the largest value is ever going to be A of M. OK, that makes sense. And then if you want to figure out what the maximum is, remember, you're going to figure out the largest value of your carrier added with your message. So you're not taking a look at the absolute value anymore. So in this case, it's A of C plus A of M, okay? And then for the minimum, remember, you're figuring out what the smallest value is over time. So it actually makes sense. So it's actually minus A of M instead. Remember, what you're doing is when you're taking your message signal and you're adding it by an offset, which is A of C, so remember, it fluctuates between plus minus A of M. And then when you add a DC offset, it'll fluctuate between AC plus A M and AC minus, right? So what's happening here now is that it looks like this, so AC plus and AC minus, and then it fluctuates like this instead. So that makes sense that this is the minimum here, right? And then this is the positive over here. It makes sense. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going to compute the um, modulation indices as well as the plus and minus, the positive and negative modulation indices, right? So now that we know these, what we can do first is we can evaluate just the modulation index by itself. OK, so we know that this is the peak divided by the carrier. In this case, the peak was is ever, you know, in terms of M of P is ever, it's just going to be A of M. It's never going to fluctuate from that because that's the largest value that we're going to get. OK, so once we have this, we can actually calculate the modulation index in another way. So we can actually take the largest, subtract the smallest, divided by 2 of A of C, which makes sense, right? So this goes here. So this is A max. This here is A of min. OK, when I subtract these two, what will happen is that these AFCs go away. And then you have minus minus, which becomes plus. And then we have 2 AM over 2 AC. They cancel, and you get that. So we see here that they match up, which is actually quite nice. OK, if you want to figure out what the positive modulation index is, you just take the largest amplitude, which is AC plus AM, and subtract AC. So that goes away. We're left with AM over AC. All right, and then finally, if you want to figure out what the smallest, you know, the, you know, the negative modulation index is, you take your carrier, subtract the minimum. In this case, you have AC minus, right? And then minus minus becomes a plus, and then this is what you get. So if you take a look, all these three actually match up, which is actually quite nice. And the reason why that is is because it's very simple, mainly because the, the uh, you know, the uh, largest and minus values are symmetric. It's actually even, so there's an even swing. So you have, so the maximum is plus AM, and the smallest is minus AM. So if you actually ever get the situation, then you'll actually get all three of these indices to match, which is actually quite nice. <clears throat> OK, so both definitions of the modulation index give the same result. And if that's because the actual signal is symmetric. So if you were to split up your signal into half, it's actually a mirror reflection. So that's actually why you get the same result. And I'll talk about what happens when you, you know, if this doesn't match up. And I'll talk about why that happens later. OK. So if you take a look here, all these modulation indices match up, right? So you have your mu from before, and then the plus and minus, the positive and negative also match up, which is nice. So all the definitions of the modulation indices coincide. And the reason why that is is because the message signal is symmetric with respect to the horizontal axis. So what that means is that if you were to take your signal and put a mirror right on the horizontal axis, the positive reflection is equal to the negative reflection. So that's what it means when it's symmetric. So if you ever get that situation, then that means that all the all these, you know, all the all these uh, values will actually match up. So it's symmetric with respect to the horizontal axis. So if you were to put a mirror, the you know, top and the bottom actually is a mirror reflection of each other, and that's what happens when you actually have that case. Okay. So let's take a look at a couple, you know, the first few cases here. So the first case is what happens when the 
amplitude of the message is much smaller than the actual carrier. So what this means is that the carrier height is much, much larger than the message height. Okay? So if that's the case, what's going to happen is that this offset A of C is going to be large. Okay? So A of C, this is large. So when that happens, if you have it large, and then if your uh, amplitude of your message is very small, you're going to have a large DC offset, and then the message varies very small. And then if that's the case, if you have this particular situation, then what's going to happen is that the envelope is going to be above the horizontal axis. And in that case, you can certainly use an envelope detector for this, because none of the actual amplitude modulated wave, you know, the actual, you know, this will ever dip below the horizontal axis. So in that case, if you have this, then we know that the modulation in this is going to be less than one, so it's perfectly suitable for an envelope detector, which is nice. All right? And when we get the point where it's actually equal to one, what's going to happen is that if this is equal to one, this means that AM is equal to AC. Then what's going to happen is that it will vary between, you know, AC plus AM, and then if AC is equal to AM, the minimum is actually going to be equal to zero, right? Because AC is equal to AM. So this would be actually 2 a.m. Okay? So it's going to vary between two, you know, twice the amplitude of the uh, message, and then it goes down to 0. And if that's the case, we're right at the corner case where anything below the horizontal axis will mean that you're going to have a phase reversal. So this is the case where mu is right equal to 1. Okay? So when mu is equal to 1, you get this case where the actual amplitude of the envelope is right touching at the horizontal axis, but it's not actually crossing. So this is actually right at the corner case where you can actually still use an envelope detector, but it's a borderline case. So anything, anything other than that, you won't, it won't be able to work. And this is, this is what happens when the message is larger than the carrier. So when that happens, what will happen is that if you take a look at the maximum minimum, this means that A of C is less than A of M. So what that will mean is that it will actually if you actually perform the uh, minimum calculation, if you did this, then what will happen is that this subtraction, if you were to subtract both sides of this, becomes greater than less than zero. In that case, it actually dips below the horizontal axis and you get phase reversals. So this is actually what is known as overmodulation, or when mu is greater than one. And if that's the case, you can't use an envelope detector for that, unfortunately. So you can take a look at the first couple of cases, perfectly fine for an envelope detector, but as soon as you make the message height of the actual carrier for the message larger than the actual uh, carrier itself, and you won't be able to use an envelope detector for that, unfortunately. All right? Okay. What time we got? Okay. I'll I'll in, I'll in, in a, a couple of minutes. So what I'll do is uh, I'll think I think I'll withhold the tutorial today. I just want to finish up everything, and then when we uh, come back to the next class, I'll start with the tutorial that day. So I'll, let me just finish up uh, the theory here, and then uh, I'll do, I'll start the tutorial next class. Okay, so I should be able, I've only got maybe about 20 more slides here, so uh, I should be finished hopefully in about, so I'll let you, uh, we'll take a break, come back, I'll finish in about 20 minutes, and you should be able to get out of here by 30, okay? So uh, let's get back to this. So uh, when we're talking about single tone modulation, right, what that means is that the message is just the cosine wave. So we're going to go back to this. So what we can do now is we can take a look at the spectrum of the AM signal, right? And what we can do here is, uh, you know, remember this is the amplitude modulated signal that we have here. Let's actually take a look at what the spectrum looks like. Okay. So if we can consider this signal here, so this is the this is the AM signal. So this is the you know the envelope, or this is the actual um, transmitted signal. So this is the AM signal, right? What we can do now is let's take a look at what it looks like in terms of the frequency domain. So remember, so what we're doing here is um, if we decided to take our frequency, and then what we can do now is um, if we decide to, let's see, determine the spectrum using the frequency, yes, that's fine. So, okay, so single tone modulation, so this is what we have here. So remember, this is, this is the general form. So we have A of C plus M of T, and then cos. Okay, so this is our message signal here. Let's actually take a look at what the actual spectrum looks like in the frequency domain. So if we replace this entire thing with X of T, then if you were to perform the Fourier transform, you're just taking this x of t and you're shifting it left and right by omega c, which is the carrier frequency. All right? So this is what the original spectrum is. So if you were to take a look at, so x of t is this guy here. If you took the Fourier transform, okay, what's going to happen is, remember, the uh, Fourier transform of a constant is simply a delta. All right? So that's what happens over here. And then the Fourier transform of a cosine is just two, two deltas that are centered at whatever the frequency is concentrated at the cosine here. 
So there's actually going to be three impulses. So the first impulse is the carrier, right? Because remember, when you have the, um, so when you're taking a look at in terms of just the message itself, right, you know, the Fourier transform of a constant is just an impulse, and the Fourier transform of a cosine wave is just the two impulses, all right? And then what you're going to do next is you want to take a look at what the spectrum looks like. So you're going to do an amplitude modulation. You're going to take this and multiply it by cosine omega c. And when you do that, you actually take the spectrum and you actually shift left and right by plus minus f of c. Okay, so you have your original signal, right? So you have AC plus A of M, AM cos omega MT. So you have the one impulse that is centered at zero, that is of a height A of C. And then you have two more impulses, that's your message, which is plus minus F of M. And then you're gonna take these three impulses, and you're gonna shift them to the right by FC, and shift them to the left by FC, and you're gonna scale the amplitudes by half. And what that looks like <coughs> is this. <coughs> All right, so putting everything together, right? So we had X of F, if you remember, was AC delta F, right? And then plus A of M over two, delta F minus F of M, plus F plus F of M, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna shift it plus minus F of C, and I need to make sure that I scale it by a half, okay? And this is what's happening here. So when I shift plus minus by FC, so I get this guy here, Right, so we have these two spectrum, you know, these two impulses here that are defined by plus minus F. So what you're doing is you're taking this impulse, right, and then you have plus minus F of C. So that's what's happening over here. Okay? Then what you're doing is you're taking this one and then you're doing plus minus F of C, and that's what happens over here as well. So you're gonna have two more, so you have two additional impulses. So essentially what's happening here is you're taking the original spectrum, which is just three impulses, and you're doing plus minus F of C. And then you have to make sure that the heights are scaled by half, right? So if you remember, we had A of C and AM over 2 here. Notice that we have A of C over 2 and then A of M over 4 because you're scaling the impulses by a half due to the uh, modulation property that we saw before. So this is what happens over here. Okay, so we have three impulses. We have six impulses, you know, but, you know, plus, you know, that are centered at plus minus F of C. Okay, so... You can, so what you can do, of course, is uh, if you decide, if you can do it this way if you wish, but if you don't want to do it this way, if you don't want to remember the Fourier transfer, you can also do, use it doing trigonometric identities, okay? So what you can do here is you can expand out this expression. So this becomes AC cos omega t, so this is over here, and then A of M cos omega M, and then cos omega ct. And then what you can do here is you can use trigonometric identities, where you have the product of the two coses, you can actually split it up into two Cos is up, you know, you can plus and minus. So this becomes AM over 2. And then you can consider this as A. You consider this as B, right? So A of M over 2, and then you have cos A plus B, and then plus cos A minus B. Okay? And when, when you do that, you actually get the bottom here. Okay? And then you can just simply draw the impulses, right? So AC cos omega t it would be two impulses that are centered at f of c. So those are these guys over here, okay? And then you have these guys. You have it's centered at f c plus f m, and then uh, let's see your f c minus f m, right? Because you have two impulses. And finally, you have f c minus f m, and then minus f c plus, and that's what's going on here. Okay? So here and here, and then finally here and there. So you can do it like that if you want. There's two ways to do it. You can either use the Fourier transform method or you can just work it out using trig identities, split it up into, you know, sum of two cosines and then take the Fourier transform of each of those. It's totally up to you. Okay? All right. So here's another example and then uh, actually, you know what, let's take a break now and then uh, once you come back, I'll finish up. It should take maybe about 20 minutes and I'll let you guys go early and then next class we'll start the tutorial first thing. Okay, so let's take a break now, come back, let me finish, and then you guys can go.